So my guest today is Alan Hunkins, the author of Cracking the Leadership Code, Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. Uh, I'm proud to say Alan is a friend and not just simply a guest on the show. Alan, please introduce yourself, welcome, and let everyone know something about your background, please. Sure, Jeff, it is such an exciting day to be with you. So yeah, Jeff and I go way back, gosh, 1995, so that's dating both of us. And um, so I have been passionate about helping people kindle the fire of brilliance in themselves, whether that's personal and professional. In fact, I think it's really hard to separate the two of those out. And I've been working in organizations since 1997. I've worked with 42 of the Fortune 100 companies and have worked with leaders, over 2,000 groups of leaders in 25 countries. And what I found is that really doesn't matter what industry you're in, you're in the people business. So I found some patterns and trends and I wanted to capture those to help other leaders to shorten their learning curve. And all of those notes have now made it into this book, Cracking the Leadership Code. And I'm really excited to talk about how we all can become better leaders and better people. And when I say leaders, by the way, Jeff, I'm not talking about a job title. I'm really talking about a state of being. In fact, I think any time that any of us are trying to get someone else to do something in some way, that takes leadership. And so we all play that role in some way every day. And folks, if you're watching on camera, Alan had a small procedure done last week. He's got a Band-Aid on. Show some mercy, please. Nothing in the, in the comments area, okay? <laughs> and just so you know, I've already done it for you, okay? There we go. So uh, let's look at, at new leaders, people who are stepping up into, leaders, into leadership. What keeps an aspiring leader stuck? How do they get their feet in the, in, in the quicksand and how do we get them out of there? Yeah, so interesting research on this. I've been studying the research and it turns out that only about 23% of people believe their leaders lead well, which is a pretty shockingly low number, which has been that low for decades now. So clearly it's a lot easier said than done. What keeps new leaders stuck more than anything else is this mindset. It's that we think we need to fix something, that when we step into this role, we have to be this fixer. In fact, I'll tell you the story about this guy, Matt, that I met. Matt is a district manager for a national fast food franchise. Now, I met Matt. The company had 100 district managers, and Matt was ranked number one out of all 100. And so I asked him if he'd always been a really high performer. And he said, gosh, no. When I started, I was like 84th. And I was down there towards the bottom for a while. I said, so what changed? And he said, when I started, I had this idea that my job was to be the fixer, right? I had been, I had been promoted. I was now a leader. I was the district manager. And so every day we would get this printout of key metrics called the hot list. And the first thing I do is look at the daily hot list and see what was in red, not measuring up. And I'd go into firefighting problem solving mode. And I would hop in my car and I'd drive hustling from store to store and I'd get the managers and I'd show them the hot list and tell them what was wrong and tell them what they should do and just tell them to keep going on that. And I did that and I was driving around, I was working really hard and I was struggling and I was stuck. And, he's, and Matt said, it took me years, but I realized that people don't want a fixer, is that people actually want a leader. And so Matt changed his approach. And what he says now is when he goes into a store, the first thing he does with the store manager is he asks them about themselves, about their lives, about the person outside of work and builds relationship first. Then instead of just like, you got to do this, fix this, do this, he shares the data of the hot list, but he doesn't say, this is what you should do. He says, here's the data. What do you think we should do? So he asks first and he listens mm -hmm. to them and then together they create this strategy. And so what, Matt really modeled is what I've come to understand is these three secrets of building strong leaders, which are connection, right? Building relationship first, communication, leading by listening, and then collaboration, co-creating solutions together. And I think where so many leaders are stuck, they still hold on to this industrial age, early 20th century mindset that we are in charge, that we have to command and control. And the world has changed so much since the beginning of the industrial age. So if we're basically operating out of this 20th century, early 20th century playbook, we are destined to struggle. So I think the number one thing is to shift the mindset, stop being a fixer, move into being a leader 
who sees themselves much more as a facilitator of drawing out the talents that are already inherent inside people and finding ways to bring that out and move those resources to where they need to be in order to be successful. And I think he gave a great example in the match story of how simple it can be. And there's also the times where it's less simple, where the staff is already lost uh, and they're struggling. And maybe you've taken over the failing group. You know, they've already got that label. Everyone knows that they're the problem people. So you're arriving because, hi, I'm here to be the solution. You do what I tell you to do. Problem number one, I know that. And we'll get this all better. So what, is, what does someone do with the group that's labeled, damaged, problem, oh, horrible, horrible? We go right back to the three choice, the three options. Go right back to the connection. Yeah, I'd say we go right back to the. We start with connection, and here's an interesting thing around this. And there's been some great studies and uh, about the power of belief. So they did these studies in schools where a bunch of te kindergarten teachers were told that they had high potential. They told certain members of their class, certain students were high potential and they should be on the lookout for this sort of high potential genius like behavior in these kids. And they told them which kids it was. And at the end of the year, the teacher was like, Oh, those kids, they're amazing. They really came along. The names had been assigned completely by random. And it was basically, it's the Pygmalion effect that we see what we want to. So if you go into a situation where you think, oh, these are problem people, they're damaged goods, they don't know what they're doing, that is exactly what you're going to get, as opposed to thinking they've been in a system that has not supported them for a long time. And I think Peter Drucker, won, oh no, it's Edwards Deming that once said, you put a good person in a bad system and the bad system will win every time. It is so much easier for us to blame the person or the team, oh, that's a lousy team, they don't know what they're doing. Um, well, what in the leadership hasn't been creating the environment to foster excellence? You know, it's interesting. We talk a lot about employee engagement and how we need our employees to be engaged. And if employee engagement is down, that's going to impact so many metrics. Well, why would employees be engaged if leaders aren't engaged? I mean, it starts from the leadership. We set the tone. Albert Schweitzer famously said, example is not the main thing in influencing others. It's the only thing. So to me, it's so important that we start with believing that people are capable because that starts the, ground, the groundwork. And then from there, we start to connect. We build relationships. We find out what their needs are, what drives them. You know, I write a lot about around collaboration. We all have basic human needs that need to get addressed and satisfied for us to perform at our best. Some of those needs are the need for safety, whether that's physical safety, like what we're dealing with with coronavirus, the fact that people are having to work at a distance because it's not physically safe to be together. There's also psychologically safe. So the question is, can I speak up in a meeting and feel like there will be no repercussions? Do I feel it's safe to bring my whole self to work? So that's some psychological safety. So there's a need for safety. There's a need for energy. We wanna work in a high energy work environment. We also have a need for purpose, this belief that what we do matters, that we're contributing to something greater than ourselves, And we have this need for ownership. No one likes to be micromanaged. We all want to be able to do the work in the way we want to do it and have some latitude and autonomy about how we go about doing that. So when we're starting with the damaged group, we start with connection, finding out what their needs are, and then communicating through that so we can create an environment where they can start to move towards being better. And I think of also the organizations where not the damaged environment, but you know, people get hired for jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's as much as they're told. We need you to do such and such. And the notion of an institution having a purpose and a mission, well, it's nice on the website. And it's a nice plaque in the lobby, but there's no connecting the dots for people about how their work has relevance to what the institution set out as, as its mission. I'm not sure I, I believe in institutional missions. That's a digression on my part. But I think in terms of why did this business start off to begin with? Like, what's their origin story? You know, why does this matter? And why does this job matter? Do you see research or do you have experiences along those lines where the, the nature of the business gets conveyed 
and it's beneficial or not conveyed and it's destructive. Yeah, I've seen both sides. And the fact is, every single job in the world has meaning if we go hunting for it. If you think about it, otherwise it wouldn't exist. Now, you could say some are, you know, there used to be that TV show, Dirty Jobs, right? The guys who clean out the muck out of the sewers. It's a really valuable service to society. It needs to happen. Somebody needs to do it. That being said, I have seen leaders who approach this from the point of view of they really don't care. I remember I was sitting next to the CEO of a shoe manufacturing company and we were doing this whole, I was facilitating a team building for their top 200 leaders and I got to sit with them at dinner and I was asking him about this big, the big picture mission and purpose. And he turned to me and said, purpose? We sell effing shoes. So he didn't say effing, he actually said the F word. He said, we sell effing shoes. That's what we do, like, like whatever. You know, you know, this is a job, I'm just here to make money. And it was pretty clear in my interactions with the people around him that that was the culture of the company. It was like, this is a job. We're going off to the shoe salesman coal mines today. That's, that's just what we do. Whereas, I'll tell you another example. I was working with a, a manufacturing company that makes medical devices. And I was touring, I write about this story in the book, actually. There's a woman, and I got to tour the factory across from the corporate office. And she was doing this amazing work that was both manual labor manufacturing, but also very high tech. And her name was April. And I said, God, she got to a break. I said, April, it's, it's amazing the work that you're doing. And the tour guide had explained that what she was making, it was basically some kind of a catheterization device to help with diagno diagnosing heart patients. And I said, that's amazing work that you're doing. Can you explain exactly what you're doing here? And I thought she was going to go into some technical explanation of, well, we take this piece and we add this, this. And she turned to me, she said, well, I help pe save people's lives. What do you do? Right. So April's response, though, Jeff, was no accident, because what that company does is every quarter they have a company wide town hall and they bring in some of the patients that have been served by their products and they share how their lives have been changed. So people have a direct link, a line of sight to see how what I'm doing makes an, a difference. And I think the issue for many of us, it isn't what we do. It's that we don't see the line of sight. We oftentimes work in an organization that's pretty complex. So we may be one or two or three or four or five levels removed from that end user in terms of making the difference to them. And we don't even realize what the difference that we're making. So it goes on and it has a lot to do, as you said before, with the origin story. And do we continue to tell these stories and not just once or twice, but we have to remind ourselves again and again, again, I know you've been in a married relationship for a while. I don't think Sharon, your wife would be, oh, well, I said I love you on our wedding day, Jeff. I think that's enough. I, I mean, it hasn't changed, right? I mean, the fact is we need to say these same things again and again. So reminding people of the why we do what we do is something that we should be revisiting on a frequent basis. I agree wholeheartedly. And, and I always think about organizations and some of the shadow behaviors that show up that undermine what they ostensibly talk about as being important to them. And, you know, when you have leaders who are subverting the various intentions that they proclaim are important, it's fascinating to point out the incongruences between what they say and what they do, right? Totally, totally. So interesting thing. So generally, leaders and reality generally are mere, op mere images of each other. So the way leaders generally think about stuff is like, oh, I say this, it's really important. This is what I do, not as important. And then what we measure, not nearly as important. Whereas from the flip side, the way reality or followers take it all, what are you measuring? Because I'll figure out how to give you the measurements you want because, and if I have to game the system, I will. And then I follow your behavior. And then, oh, did you say something? I forgot, what was that, right? So we flip it and so, you talk about these shadow behaviors and the discongruencies. I think one of the biggest issues, particularly, because leaders say, oh, I, you know, people are our greatest resource, or our greatest asset. I mean, we talk about this. I think one of the biggest things that I see leaders struggling with time and time again, especially in this day and age, is let's just call it what it is. It's impatience, right? The fact is that to build connection with other human beings takes time. And showing empathy, and my definition for empathy is showing people that you understand them and care how they feel, isn't just some item you can check off of a to-do list. Now, yeah, you can send out emails at the speed of light in our digital age, information can travel that quickly, but human relationships take time. 
And showing empathy means showing patience. And our organizations are giving this, this message, like you've got results to deliver. We've got to drive for results. In fact, I'm sure you've seen many organizations driving for results is considered a core leadership competency. And I get that. You know, we can't just sit around here. We're not in the group therapy business. Like, hey, is everyone feeling okay about everything? That's not why we're in business. And leadership wisdom is knowing when do you go fast and when do you go slow? Because yes, you want to drive for results, but driving for results shouldn't come at the cost of driving over the people who are trying to work with you to deliver those results. It's funny, you know, we've been talking about leadership and then there's management. Mm -hmm. And the management people more often than not are the ones who are promoted because they were the most competent person at that time. They've gotten their rewards and they're measured by task and task delivery. So it's no wonder that that's what they tend to focus on because that's how they got to where they are. And yet leaders are different. It's not about motivation at that point. It's about inspiration at that point. And that involves heart space more than it is, today we're going to produce 2,412 widgets. Yeah. That's gonna be up two widgets from Last week, you think you can do it? Yeah! And, and we're laughing about this, but we've all been in environments where this is how it's done. Yeah, yeah. And it's crazy. Yeah, so it's interesting because people say, oh, well, you know, I'm not a leader, I'm a manager. Well, if you are influencing other people and their experience of work, you are a leader. You may be doing a very bad job at it, but you are leading. Again, Gallup has probably got the most famous research on this. You know, they spent over 25 years interviewing over a million employees around the world, including 80,000 managers. And they wanted to find what made the most successful employees successful. And by success, they measured it by higher levels of productivity, higher levels of profitability, lower levels of turnover, and higher levels of customer satisfaction and loyalty. And they found the number one factor that created the most successful employee was what was their relationship with their immediate supervisor. So whether you call that person a manager or a leader, it's the immediate supervisor. That person sets the tone. They found that 70% of the difference between lousy, good, and great culture is directly attributed to that immediate manager or leader right there. And so, you know, I used to joke, I used to say, I got into leadership because I thought that leaders make a difference. And what I found over, over 20 years of research and practice is that leaders don't make a difference. Leaders are the difference. And so you, if you're in that role, congratulations, because that responsibility, it's been, it's like, it's that target on your back. <laughs> and you have to know that whether or not you know it's there, it's there. The responsibility is with you and you can either ignore it, in which case you're now creating a culture by default, or you can embrace it and create a culture by design and be intentional about it. And when Alan mentioned the target on the back, um, in his TEDx talk, he tells, he tells a, to me, very funny story about coming off of a weekend where he was stepping into leadership and he received a gift of a t-shirt uh, from someone who uh, on, the, on the front it said leader and on the back, he was encouraged to turn it around and there it was, the bullseye. And um, was, was reminded that you're always the target. It's a question of what kind of target you wanna be. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you for that mentorish moment of wisdom, Jeff, because you, you inspired that story. Um, yeah. And with that, I just want to point out that there are other things that people can be doing better to, to model the connection, the collaboration, and what's the third C? Communication. Communication. How can they communicate better? Great question. So communication is really harder than it looks. And the reason why is we all think I've got two ears, they're in good working condition, I've got one mouth, I've got fingers that type and eyes that can see, I'm communicating well. Well, that's what we think. Unfortunately, communication ranks as the number one biggest challenge in workplace environments. And the reason why I think George Bernard Shaw said it best when he said the greatest problem with communication, it's the illusion that it's taken place. 
So we're communicating, yes, but the goal of communication isn't communication's sake. The goal of communication is to create shared understanding. And the reason that shared understanding is so important is because understanding becomes the platform on which we build all future action. So if we have common, shared, solid foundation of understanding, we can now make great decisions to get great results. But if our platform foundation is rickety and shoddy, we're gonna make poor decisions, we're gonna get poor results. And so as leaders, we have to understand that the default setting for communication is actually misunderstanding, miscommunication. And it's our job to make sure that we keep bringing people back to alignment to make sure that we are aligned between what you say, what you mean, and what I hear. Because way easier said than done. I'll give you a quick example of just how easy it is to fall into one of these traps because we're wired for misunderstanding. All of us, even me, and I teach this stuff. So uh, my wife, Mary, and I have these two friends named Pam and Charlie who live in Washington, DC, and they drove up to visit us for the weekend in Western Massachusetts. Now our house has got a very narrow driveway that widens out at the end so we can park our two cars side to side. So when Pam and Charlie came to visit, they parked their car right behind our two, basically blocking us in, which really wasn't a problem until I had to leave to go to the airport. At which time I said, Pam, could you please move your car and park it out in front of the house? And she said, you want me to park where? I said, just go park your car in front of the house. You're sure? Yeah, please, if you don't mind. She said, okay, I'll park my car in front of the house. And she goes off and I didn't think anything else of it. And thought that was a little odd. So I get my suitcase, I get in the car and I start to slowly back out of the driveway, checking my mirrors. And then just out of the corner of my eye, I see the strangest thing, Jeff, because it's, it's, it's Pam's car. And she's parked her car in front of the house, as in directly in front of the house, as in on the flower beds directly in front of the house, as in flower beds being crushed by the wheels of her car now. Now, at that moment, I was just thinking, oh, my, Pam, what were you thinking? When I say park in front of the house, what I mean is park your car on the curb on the street. Like, where else would you park a car? But clearly, she had taken my words literally. And so I was suffering from what a psychologist would call the projection bias, which is when you unconsciously assume that other people have the exact same meaning in your mind as you do. Now we'll see the projection bias at work all the time. You hear it when people say things like, well, I sent them the email, they should know what to do. Or, you know, doesn't the senior leadership realize what a stupid process this is? So the question is, how can we get rid of these misunderstandings? So here's a really simple tool that anyone can use really easily. I call it asking for a receipt. So if you think about why do we have receipts, right? So receipts are proof of a complete transaction. And if you think about it, in life, when you ask for a receipt, you might skip getting a receipt when you go to the store and get a candy bar, but you would never dream of buying a house without getting a receipt. So in communication, asking for a receipt is a way for you to confirm that your information hasn't just been received, but it's actually been understood. And there's a great story that brings this to life from the fast food industry. So back in the 1980s, you remember, they started the drive-throughs in all the fast food restaurants. And at the beginning, the drive-through process was a nightmare. It was very common. You drive up to the intercom, you'd place your order, and then you'd drive up to the window to pick up your food, and the order would be filled with mistakes. And this was common across the industry for like two years. And then all of a sudden, they fixed the problem. The drive-through mistake rates just started to plummet. You might be thinking, what was the newfangled technology? It was such an easy fix the employees started repeating the order back to customers. Oh, sorry, you want three cheeseburgers, three fries, and three Pepsis? Is that right? Three, yes, yes, yes. Okay, and then they make the order, confirming understanding before taking action. And the way I see it is, look, if Taco Bell will invest in this simple technology for a 99-cent taco, don't you think that our work deserves the same level of clarity? So it's a good example of the commitment on the part of a leader to make sure that we are confirming getting understanding before we take the next step of action. So how many of us have meetings where we don't do that, right? Where the meeting ends and we're like, okay, everyone knows what they're doing, right? Good, goodbye, see ya. And so instead of taking that extra five or 10 minutes going, let's go around the circle, what's everyone doing? Just to make sure we're all clear and on the same page and we're aligned. So that's an example of how you can ask for a receipt and get and better when, communication. And when employees respond in their thought process of, what does she think I am, a moron? You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that response because I've worked in offices like that. Of course. Well, here's the thing. This is why it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. So there's a big difference me saying, me saying, all right, everyone, let's go around the table just to make sure we're on the same page. 
um, as opposed to having some more tact and subtlety and saying, hey, everybody, you know, I know that for me, I have experienced walking out of here and not being clear. So if you don't make a big deal out of it and you treat people with respect as opposed to thinking, okay, again, this is the difference between talking at people and talking with them, which goes back to the mindset. Do you see yourself as the fixer or are you the facilitator, the leader who's bringing things out? And I feel if you embody that and you've already built a connection based on empathy and credibility and trust, people are going to go along on the ride with you because they know they're the kind of person that they want to follow. You know, I had the idea of our sharing some of our failures. And I'm going to go first um, to acknowledge one of my failures because I've had a couple of businesses where I played fixer and cheerleader in chief and didn't really take the time making connection with my people. As a result, all I was doing was hammering them over and over and over again. And eventually what starts to happen is they become numb to it. Um, that's what happened to me. And the result wound up being I divorced my first business partner um, you know, just because I didn't feel supported. I was doing all the sales. He was doing all the complaining with the co-conspirators that we, we, we were ostensibly you know, there were employees, but he wasn't into it because I overwhelmed him and I overwhelmed them. And I know you know me well enough to, to know how that could very easily have been part of my persona uh, in the early years that we knew one another. Yeah. And certainly before that. Um, so what I've learned over the course of time is as quick, as intuitive as I, I can be, I have to slow down at times in order to make sure that everyone's engaged in the process uh, and I don't wind up losing them. You got one for you? <laughs> I have one. I have more than one, but I'll start with one. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I talked earlier about this sense of driving for results shouldn't come at the expense of driving over people that deliver the results. And I could have been talking to the mirror at the time because I'm thinking back early in my career, I was oftentimes, I was facilitating for large groups sometimes where I would be facilitating for five, six hundred people or even over a thousand. And when I would do this, I would have these teams of support facilitators, sometimes up to 40 or 50 people. And I was basically in charge. I was leading that. And in that particular environment, you know, I like to think of myself as this caring, empathic person. I'm really... But when I was in that role where I was so focused on the client and the outcome, I really started driving and I'll say steamrolling over people to the point where I literally got feedback from one of the support facilitators saying, oh, you realize that after the meeting that you lead, five people break down in tears and two of them said they never want to work with you again. And that was some of the hardest feedback to hear. And you know, realizing, and it was from someone I trusted, and I heard that my first reaction was wanting to get defensive. Like, no, 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 that, but you don't understand. I, uh, uh, and I realized that wasn't the first time that I'd heard that kind of feedback about being kind of a little arrogant, a little arrogant, and, and, and being driving and, and being too quick, too quick time, too sharp, and not really including people. And I took that feedback to heart. And I had to step back and apologize. And I really shifted my approach when I was working with a team to the point where I was, you know, this whole sense of building connection first. I, to me, it's such this absolute law of how do you have a relationship without human to human connection? So I always look for ways to find that human connection first, even when I'm hiring, let's my, my dentist, I go in, I mean, everywhere, I want to create some kind of a human connection, not only because I think it gets better results, I have a lot more fun doing it and it's a lot less stressful. I feel like I'm, I'm now working with people instead of for them or they're working for me. I just feel like it's a much more, yeah, it's a much, much more joyous way to work and to live. So that's one of the big wake up call failures that I had that I learned a lot from. You, you used one of my favorite words that every person I coach, um, you know, it's always a problem word for them. Fun. The notion, the notion that you can have fun in the process of doing work isn't supposed to be about fun. Yeah. Back to the 19th century, the 20th century, 
Yeah, it's true. It's amazing how many people think that it's this drive, drive, drive. Like, again, we use these mechanistic tools, right? Driving, like we got to, you know, we got to drill stuff down into the front lines. I mean, when's the last time you said, gosh, you know, no one from senior leadership has drilled anything into me lately. I miss that. I mean, I mean, the fact is we don't, we're not machines. We need to create some space for humanity. And it's so important to do that. And folks, winners find the way to win and losers have lots of excuses for it. And one of the ways that they find the way to win is they understand that their biggest asset are their people, not the problem. They work with their people and support their people being great. And through that, and evolving from the mechanistic approach, it's just a different tone and tenor and you get better results. I love this has been fun. It has been fun using your F word again. We're back at the F word, fun. That, that's right. That's the F word that you can use, folks. And like, how can people find out more about you, the work that you do? I'll have a link to the, to the, to the, um, the book on Amazon and the show notes. How can Fantastic. people find out more about you? Yeah. Easiest place to go is actually the book has its own website, which is www.crackingtheleadershipcode.com, which is easier to spell than my name. That'll take you right to the book website. And then when you're there, you can download the first chapter to get a preview that will also link you right to my website pages. So you can just from there navigate and learn more about the work that I do. I do coaching, consulting, training, and speaking either with individuals, teams, and or organizations all under the umbrella of helping people to become better leaders. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn as you like as well. And could you spell your name for them, folks? Sure, it's Alain, the French, A-L-A-I-N, Hunkins, H-U-N-K-I-N-S, which is alainhunkins.com. You can find me there. Fabulous. And folks, I'll be back soon with more. I'm Jeff Altman, The Big Game Hunter. You can find out more about me at my website, thebiggamehunter.us. Go there and go exploring. There's a lot there that will help you. And in the meantime, I hope you have a spectacular day. And I want to encourage you, be great. Take care.